Hey, this is Alex Head, founder of Subtext Radio. This is Subtext. Please go ahead and click the like button and the subscribe button. It really helps us to reach new audiences and promote the artists that we work with. Hit like and hit subscribe. Welcome to Decolonization in Action, a podcast that considers how knowledge, medicine, science, and the arts are being decolonized today. My name is Christina Comer, and I'm broadcasting from the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, Germany. For the last episode of Season 1, we're really happy to have Dr. Sumigen Sivanesan as our first guest host. Sumigen is an antidisciplinary artist, researcher, and writer currently based in Berlin And in this episode, he takes us back to Madrid during the 25th UN Climate Conference called the Conference of Parties, or this past year's COP25, which took place at the beginning of December in 2019. Hello, my name is Simugan Simonason. I'm an artist and writer based in Berlin. This COP was notable because it was originally scheduled to occur in Santiago, Chile, And in about October, late October 2019, Chile announced that it could no longer host the COP because of the People's Revolution and the political upheavals that were occurring there. So at this very last minute, a lot of civil society groups and activists also changed their plans to travel to Madrid. On December 6th, there was a large manifestation in the streets of Madrid, where around 500,000 people attended. Uh, And then over the following five or six days, the People's Summit occurred at uh, Complutense University. One of the main issues being discussed at this year's COP was Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, and this concerns emissions trading. Um, And indigenous groups, civil society groups, youth movements, um, and other kinds of activists found this a very frustrating process. At one point, the reference to human rights had been removed from the wording of um, these guidelines, these rule books, I think is how it's referred to. And my recordings end with um, a manifestation, a casolorado, a noise manifestation that was occurring inside, outside the COP, in support of a sit-in that was being um, conducted by Indigenous groups, civil society groups, youth movements inside the COP, Um, against the removing of these words and the marginalisation and and bullying of certain groups. Madrid was the the 25th COP, so it's 25 years of negotiations, and a lot of people feel very frustrated that these negotiations have really produced nothing. I was talking to a colleague, Delia, from the Artivist Network. This is a group that organises art workshops that support manifestations and actions and other events that take take place around the COP. And she described the blue zone, the negotiation zone inside the COP to me as a, as a tragic circus. A lot of people will say that after 25 years of negotiations, the, the COPs have really not produced anything. They produce a lot of hot air, but no emissions cuts. While the conference failed to bring transformative change, This episode is dedicated to the climate justice activism and organizing that did take place. Returning to the climate activists from the front lines, who demanded solutions that reflect the needs and daily realities of those most impacted by the climate crisis, which shifted the conversation from carbon credits to climate justice. never been an issue about simply about the environment. And that's why we have to understand why those climate negotiations 
have never delivered what we needed. Because what is actually happening in those negotiations is actually a fight between what I would say the colonizers and the colonized. It's we're negotiating who lives and who dies. That's what they've always been negotiating for the last 20 years, about protecting their political interests and their political economy. And when we look at the world, we know that the reality of the people who are the most impacted, the half the world's population, who are the least responsible, they're also the ones living on less than $5 a day. They're also the ones facing issues around hunger. They're also the ones without access to water. They're also the ones who don't have access to clean, to energy, to electricity or clean cooking. And the ones who are the most responsible, they're the ones who have amassed the most wealth. And they're the same people who amassed the wealth from neoliberalism, but we can go all the way back to colonialism, to slavery. This is the arc of those people who are continue to fight for uh, uh, business as usual. Now we all know that the IPCC report that came out about 1.5 degree warming set out very, very clearly. We are in decade zero, where every decision we make now will determine the extent of the violence that will be seen around the world. And yet, we have seen governments continue to do very, very little. In fact, developed countries have not cut their emissions for the last 20 years. The current pledges in the Paris Agreement will lead to at least three degrees warming and anything up to seven degrees. We've seen emissions increase since the Paris Agreement by 4% at every single year. And what are they banking on? They're banking on unproven technologies, negative emissions technologies, mad, bad, dangerous technologies to save them. But we know that the real solutions are the solutions of our movements. They're the solutions around people's own energy, about agroecology, about the right for people not to move and move. We know we have the solutions. And part of what we do in here is about building our power. Not only building our power on the inside, but building our power on the outside. What happened yesterday on the streets of Madrid sends such a powerful signal to our movement, not just... such a powerful signal that while they might be willing to sacrifice people of the global side, we stand in solidarity with all those people most impacted and we will never allow people to go into the darkness. Thank you. My name is Vanessa Nakate. I'm a climate activist from Uganda. I have been striking for 49 weeks now to demand for climate action from my government leaders and from the world leaders. Recently I started a strike mainly to save the Congo rainforest and it has been going on for 51 days now in a row. This is because uh, the governments are not talking about it. All we hear about is the Amazon and yet we have other rainforests that need to be saved. So it is important for all the rainforests to be saved and not just one. So I'm here in Madrid. I was invited by Greenpeace to take part in the negotiations of COP25 and I had the opportunity to be at the press conference yesterday with Greta Thunberg where we answered a couple of questions from the journalists. Yeah, I've been taking part in sessions today about the climate crisis and um, I'm here for the uh, for the social summit and I was also given an opportunity to speak because through speaking I believe that I can empower youth and tell them more about climate change and what we need to do for our government leaders to grant us action. Uh, in Uganda, we've had crazy rainfall for two months now, whereby each day it rains, we expect people to die, we expect homes to be destroyed. So many people have lost their lives in this period where it has been raining so heavily. Many farms have been destroyed. As we know, Uganda basically relies on agriculture. So if the farms are destroyed, many people are left with no food and many people are left with no hope for the future. So that is what is happening in Uganda right now. The the most uh, dangerous thing about it is that people don't know that this is as a result of the climate crisis as we are not taught in schools that climate uh, change is a reality. So many people are ignorant about the situation, hence they don't even know what to do about it. 
and the government leaders are silent about it. They can't explain to the people that this is a result of the climate crisis, maybe because they fear that uh, the people will demand for action. But the good thing, we are here with the activists and we are demanding for action and trying to teach and create awareness in the public. We have so many petroleum companies in Uganda and they keep increasing every day. Today I see Shell, tomorrow I see Toto, to, tomorrow I see, the other day I see another one. So we have so many uh, oil, uh, oil uh, companies in Uganda and these are contributing to the destruction of the planet and yet people don't even know about it. Uh, in Uganda they discovered oil as a mineral, so many people saw it as a blessing, but to me I saw it as a... Uh, it's more like a challenge because it is going to attract investors to come and mine that oil. Yeah, making us think that they are bringing development, yet, in, yet they are bringing destruction to our country and to our lives. Of course, um, as it is happening here, those who are the largest emitters, the ones who still try to take part in the solutions of uh, natural solutions to fight climate change. But as I said before, um, they're just brainwashing us and blinding our eyes. And in the press conference, I call them hypocrites because they are pretending to be helping us and yet they are destroying the planet in the process. So as they're sponsoring all these activities, they make us forget the damage that they have caused. So they keep on uh, damaging our planet, but we need to keep focused and look at what they have done and what they will keep doing, not at their sponsorship. Gas, petróleo, carbão, deixai-os no chão. Gas, petróleo, carbão, deixai-os no chão. Gas, petróleo, Okay, my name is Nicole Oliveira. I am from Brazil and I'm director of Light 315 Latin America. We are here to um, ask for our countries and our region, Latin America and Africa, to be decolonized. We are being recolonized energetically by companies, European companies that are investing in oil, uh, coal and gas blocks in Brazil and in Latin America. So there has been an uh, oil leak of more than 10,000 tons that reach the whole Brazilian shore from northeast all the way to south. And we are here to call attention to the press and to the world about this oil leak and to say that we need to leave it in the ground. Galp from Portugal, Shell um, and Chevron and all of them, you know, uh, Halliburton, uh, Total, all companies that are in Latin America doing drilling. My name is Marta Bordons. I'm from Seville, the south, of, the south of Spain, and I'm a member of Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion and Greenpeace in my city. I'm here especially uh, joining the, the social summit. I'm not really interested in the official COP because I think that the real COP is the one that, the real summit is the one that is happening here in Madrid in, in the Complutense University because it's where the indigenous people have the, really the, the voice, the leading voice and the leading role, not like in the official one. Well, I'm uh, now getting more and more involved about this uh, uh, fracking problem because in my city, in Seville, they're, stand and they're starting to, to do some explorations to see if it's worthy or profitable to, to do the drillings and do the fracking in, in my city. So I started to worry about this locally, but now I realize, uh, after learning more, that it's a global problem and that normally 
like in Europe, uh, we are banning uh, fracking. We don't want to do it in our own countries because we know how dangerous it is and how terribly it is, like environmentally speaking and socially speaking and um, health, um, like the health of the people speaking. Uh, so we are importing those um, that gas that is being like that frac gas from the global south. So I'm learning that it's a, a global problem, and now it's, um, that's why I'm especially more involved now. During the, the social summit, it was a great chance to get to know and to listen to the voices of these indigenous peoples. Uh, from especially from South America, I talk more with the, the people from Latin America and a Mapuche woman from Chile. Uh, she was telling me about all this extractivist uh, problem, like um, we the countries in Europe taking all the resources from the global South uh, territories for our own use and benefit. So she gave me like this metaphor that is super powerful about how she wouldn't like somebody putting uh, his hand inside her guts to pull out her organs and then put them in another body. That is basically what we are doing with the planet and what we are doing with the territories in the global south. We are taking all the resources to bring us to our home, but we don't want to touch ours. Like, we don't want fracking in our places, we want, but we want that to happen in other places so we can mm, benefit from that. And I don't like that at all. <laughs> But she was called Panchita. just left the U.S. Embassy. We were only there for a few minutes um, to share a story, to uplift the experiences of the missing, murdered, and indigenous women before we were um, pushed out and uh, threatened with arrest by uh, law enforcement and police. Um, we didn't get to finish the planned programming, and um, we were all uh, just kind of frazzled still, even up to now, just still kind of we haven't reconvened to, to really 
talk through what went on, but it, it was quite chaotic towards the end of it. But the moments that we did get to share together, the moments that we were singing the Woman Warrior song is something that I'll carry with me for always. It was really beautiful to be in the space of the perpetrator of the violence against uh, indigenous women to let them know that we are still here and we will continue to to fight for our women, to stand up for our women, and to, to fight for our Mother Earth and to stand up for our Mother Earth. Uh, the exploitation and the destruction of Mother Earth and the extraction of resources from Mother Earth is directly correlated to the violence against women. And for me, coming from the Mariana Islands and Micronesia, we have a long history of militarization in our islands and we experience a slow death from the toxic legacy left behind by the U.S. military. And the U.S. military is the number one consumer of the fossil fuels, is the number one consumer of the extractive industries that are displacing people throughout the world. It is the number one perpetrator and protector of this industry. And we need we need to be calling out and dismantling the, the military industrial complex. Right now, the, the U.S. military is forming the largest military training range in the world, in my land, homeland and in my home waters in the entire region of Micronesia. I also wanted to bring up the U.S., the, the experience of the women of the Marshall Islands who are still living through the contamination of their lands from the 60 bombs that were that were nuclear bombs that were tested in their waters and lands post-World War II. They are still looking for um, reclamation, retribution, reconciliation with the United States. They are not getting the health care that they need and, they, and generations later they're experiencing um, health problems and health issues. And that is an issue, another issue that's, that gets invisibility, that doesn't have um, the lens and the imagery that is needed to bring the healing that they need and to bring the, the uh, justice that they need. Uh, I'm just so in awe of the women here and their resilience because for 500 years we have been experiencing and suffering at the hands of the patriarchal and, and capitalistic and, and colonial systems and it's a time that we put an end to it and I'm just so in awe and empowered by the resilience of all the women here and I hold them and the solidarity that they offer me and I give back to them so deeply in my heart. Home, our home is not a sacrifice zone. Our, our home, our home is not a sacrifice zone. Our home, our home is not a sacrifice zone. Our home, our home is not a sacrifice zone. Atlante Solotine, Lue Choktui, Hotsi Asti, Totine Yatieta, Nigel Henry Robinson, Husie. My name is Nigel. That was a language called Dene Sutlane. Uh, my people are the Dene. It wasn't Spanish, it wasn't English, it probably wasn't a language any of you know. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you all today to stand in solidarity with uh, all of these, all, my relatives here. We're fighting all these different fights in their communities. And in reality, our peoples all over the world can't afford another carbon bomb. This project Tech Frontier is putting out, it's going to make the world unravel. The um, the impacts that it is already having on our communities, uh, the tar sands in general, is extremely dramatic. I'm, I'm from a place called Cold Lake First Nations, which is right in the heart of the tar sands. It's on the southern edge. Um, and our people, we are in bed with oil and gas, and we have seen the, the detriments to our people's health that comes with that kind of, uh, that kind of dirty, dirty industry rolling in. Our people have seen our resources and our lands dispossessed for over 185 years in Cold Lake First Nations. And um, there have been many tactics to do this. One of them is the residential school system. This is a system that has removed indigenous children from our communities and forced them into an education that isn't theirs so that they can become useful in the economy of the nation state of Canada. And a lot of our community members have uh, experienced sexual abuse, extreme physical abuse, and th these, syst these schools were only closed down in 1996. And my father, he went to one of these schools and he, he, um, he ended up 
working with Primco Dene, which is one of these oil companies. And he, ex he suffered from extreme alcoholism, from going through these residential schools and the trauma that he lived with. And he was paid $16 an hour, which isn't a lot of money in Canada. And he died on the line. He was 46 years old when he died from an alcohol-related death. And this, this is relevant because our people experience intergenerational trauma from the residential school system, which was imposed so that our lands and our knowledges can be dispossessed and our, uh, our, our personhood can be replaced with a Canadian identity that <laughs> values oil, that values um, a different method of economic, uh, a, a different method of economics. In our Indigenous community, sustainability is at the center of our peoples. Sustainability with our peoples and with our, our, our environments that we actually live in. In the capitalist system, at the center of it is individualism and personal gain. Keep it in the ground! 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 So for everyone here who is at COP who is lobbying for oil and gas, you need to see Indigenous people as human beings. We, had, we didn't achieve personhood until 1960. Before 1960, indigenous peoples in Canada were considered flora and fauna. We were as good as animals. And we were shot dead like animals as well. And there would be no repercussions with settler peoples who did that. This Tech Frontier mine, it's going to be the largest proposed oil sands project, the largest oil sands mine ever in human history. It's going to create six megatons of carbon per year which is extremely dramatic. We can't afford that. No carbon bombs! No carbon bombs! No carbon bombs! No carbon bombs! And just this morning at the U.S. Embassy, we held an event for missing and murdered Indigenous women. And we didn't even have the time for one or two speakers. We got kicked out by the local police. We were once again silenced. And women are affected greatly by these oil and gas projects. You know, there's man camps that result from these these oil and gas industries. In all the different communities where where oil and gas happens, man camps erupt. And uh, my 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 dear relative Casey said this morning that this results in uh, forced prostitution, drugs and alcohol, and violence to women. And we need to end that. So there's many many fronts to this fight with oil and gas that we need to attack and we need to start moving forward in a good and kind way together to end, to stop these carbon bombs. Canada has never rejected a tar sands project. Tech Frontier, let's let this one be the one. Public narrative needs to come together and say no to this project. Masi Cho everyone, thank you so much. <laughs> My name is uh, Dana Tisha Tram. I am the chief of the Banda Kuchin First Nation. We are a self-governing First Nation, 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle in the Yukon Territory, and 60 miles east from the Alaska border, making us the, the most northwestern settlement in Canada. So I'm here at COP uh, representing my people as we are some of the global leaders in the world working on climate change right now. Uh, as it pertains towards decolonization, as well as indigenous perspectives, I think I've seen a lot of the same kind of mindset that are realized physically here than in most spaces. We know about reservation systems, uh, the reservation and the Indian Act utilized in Canada practiced in the apartheid in South Africa. They basically carbon copied our practice there because it was so successful from the overt colonization of the indigenous peoples in Canada it was used in South Africa, but we see the same thing in, in all colonial states and in, in Australia and all of the rest. 
So here at COP, we have the green zone, and there's an indigenous pavilion off in the corner, separated from uh, a lot of the major discussions and other things going on, which has effectively become its own kind of international climate change conference reservation as well, that we're stuck into one side, one corner, and uh, not really given access to all other of the same places, which is a compartmentalization of our voice. If there's a compartmentalization of our voice, what's really happening is a compartmentalization of our ideas that are very inconvenient for colonial systems. And how that pertains to climate change is, at the end of the day, when it comes to anthropogenic climate change, we're not actually dealing with a climate issue, we're dealing with a human issue, a human narrative issue because the earth will be fine. It's whether us as a species want to continue with the earth in the future. No. Colonism has, colonization and colonism has had no problems um, doing absolutely horrendous and treacherous things to human beings as well as to animals, and on the earth at scale. We have uh, rape used as a tool against indigenous peoples in North Americas, as well as every other continent, when the indigenous peoples and our philosophies, which were discerned from natural systems in the land, were a major inconvenience towards their capitalization, as well as uh, their systems being propagated. So largely, we would be removed, executed, uh, uh, outright genocide, uh, everything under the sun. But the only difference now is that the earth is the final uh, system and it is the foundation of all of our species and lives that colonism and colonization, colonialism can finally be seen for what it is because it is now affecting their people. And that's when we see it become a huge issue because indigenous peoples have been talking about our ecologies, saving animal systems, the power and knowledge held within plants, forest systems, ecosystems. We've been saying that since day one. Now when it starts affecting their colonial states and their people, does it become a big thing? But here at uh, international uh, negotiations where we see through Article 6 of the Paris Accord where human rights are now being subtracted, well, that's lunacy. Because if human rights, which therefore by implication are indigenous rights, are being taken out of these documents and talks, then really what we're seeing through implication is corporate rights, which are really what are driving the scene here. Largely what's happening is that uh, Article 6 in human rights is a, is a major inconvenience for China. China is one of the uh, biggest fiscal contributors towards some of these international tables, especially at the UN, so they have no problem trading favor for a favor. And they've been working a lot with some of the other dictatorial states, such as uh, uh, the Arabic countries and some other that don't really propagate or believe in democracies. And uh, they basically are banding together and, and pushing a lot of these things out. When most money systems around the world are not attached to gold standards, but are actually writing bonds to uh, central banks, um, a lot of our sovereignty is atrophied. And so is our sovereignty as human beings when these negotiators aren't really able to be themselves, they don't have that mandate. They're being driven by larger countries which are derived from GDPs and all of the rest. So if you look at any foot soldier on the ground in major genocidal movements, they won't take responsibility for it. They'll say, well, I was just following orders. Also tying back to Article 6, I would make another argument that I don't think a lot of people would hear, and coming from a matriarchal people, 
I would say that we're living in a very male-dominated society. It's over-logical. Our education systems are suffering from what's called suppression of the feminine, which is the feminine sides of our minds. In our culture, we have the two-spirited people, um, feminist-leaning males or male-leaning females or homosexuals are um, regarded as a very special people in our society. And there's a very special place in our society for them. Um, our society does not dictate who they are or what their sex is or how their identity should be formulated. It, it's, actually, it's the reverse. We and our societies are informed by how they identify themselves. I really believe a large solution to the climate issue and to the colonial issue is to bring the feminine back into our systems. The woman and the female has been dominated for many centuries in colonial practices. Women were subjugated and they were put down. Whereas in our culture, the creator had chosen woman to create, not man. So she holds a very special place in the very center of our societies as she's the conduit in which creation is practiced. Yes, the man has a part of that, but we don't control the show. So if we take that to the, our philosophies, we need to bring the philosophy of the feminine back into our systems. And from a principle, it will reinvigorate the nuances and trickle down and bring new life into a dying system. We have all of the solutions that we need, but at 2019, at the 25th COP, from a little pavilion of 25 you know, square feet that are given to us, I don't see that happening and being practiced here at these tables. But that just puts the onus back on the people. And maybe that's where the responsibility should be. Corporations aren't going to save you. Your major governments are not going to save you. They're parts of the solution. But it's time to get back to the punk revolution to the indigenous revolution, to a feminine revolution, and there needs to be a new male revolution because this toxic male ideology and these preconceived, compartmentalized um, notions that are waiting for us as vehicles to drive this society forward are not serving any of us. It's time that we take all of the things that we know and play jazz. This is the Decolonization in Action podcast. After COP25, the voices of Black, Indigenous, people of color, youth, and other activists continue to be heard. After the demonstration in front of the U.S. Embassy was shut down, we also continue to listen to Indigenous women powerfully sing the Women's Warrior Song, a song written by First Nations elder Martina Pierre that honors missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. This song and Indigenous-led organizations and activism continue to bring attention to violence against Indigenous women who in North America experience the highest rates of murder and sexual assault, and to expose the violent realities of the fossil fuel industries, as well as the ongoing impact of extraction on Indigenous unceded lands and the legacies of colonialism. A special thanks to all speakers. We are very grateful to have had this opportunity to share their activist work and to learn about how the climate crisis affects their communities and the solutions and knowledge they have to confront it. A special thanks also to Ruth Miller from Native Movement, who shared information about the Women's Warrior Song, as well as how this song especially speaks to the daily realities of Indigenous women and the ongoing violence of colonialism and of extractive industries. And a special thanks to Sumigan Sivanesan for hosting this episode and for contributing his up-close experience of COP25. 
Please find links to all the speakers and organizations mentioned in this episode on our website at decolonizationinaction.com. Please like, share, and rate our episodes on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at Deck in Action. Thanks for joining us.